In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of his altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, in word, in deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as a, his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercies of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to the last of life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. In our midst, enliven our faith and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 to 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself that they might declare my praise. 
This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 14. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to press to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus began to tell the, parable, the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a third. This one also was wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And then will the owner of the vineyard do to them. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour. For they perceived that he had told this parable against them. And they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and judication and the governor. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, <clears throat> and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope you'll forgive me for not wearing my vestments uh, this morning. And uh, the organist got away with it last week. So <laughs> I, I'm out of sorts this morning, so I hope you'll bear with me. I didn't want to wrestle with uh, vestments, and I get them all tangled up and stuff like that. Anyhow, anyhow uh, the text for this morning's message is in Philippians 4. Uh, beginning at the fourth verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about such things. What you have learned and received and heard from me, practice in these things, and God will give you his peace. That is our text. You know, at any given time, about 10% of the American population is being treated from some anxiety disorder. One doctor said that at least 60% of the people that come to his office are coming in because they can't deal with worry and anxiety. Another doctor said if he were a preacher, he'd preach often on worry and anxiety because of all the damage it does in people's lives. Dr. Hans Selle said much of the disease is what he calls twisted thinking. And one of the greatest things about twisted thinking is this worry habit. Compared to all previous generations, People find it today harder to get out of bed and more reasons to get into bed. Now the word worry. I guess they didn't have a clip. Oh, it just came off. Oh, it came off the clip. Thank you. Here we go. The word worry, by the way, comes from the uh, from the word choke or strangle. You've heard the expression, somebody being worried sick. Worry and anxiety, they do choke and strangle people, that's for sure. And most often what we worry about is worse than what we're worried about. In fact, it often doesn't even come to happen. Things that we're worried about never takes place. And it's counterproductive. People often borrow trouble. Someone said this, someone said worry is the interest paid by those who borrow trouble. It's a thought pattern. Some people get out of bed in the morning and say, I wonder what's going to go wrong today. Now, I don't want to come off sounding like there's nothing to be concerned about in life. Indeed, there is. I mean, people have lost their jobs. There's, there's sickness. There's family problems money problems. I mean, and there's a lot to worry about in our world today. I guess you got this war going on with Russia. People are concerned about a total war. And of course, people are worried about sickness, dying. How about the COVID-19 virus? Still among us somewhat. Something to worry about. I've had a lot of things to be excited about in my own life, too. I know what the word, it's cancer, Norb, a couple of times. And I know how it affects your life and how you are concerned about it. But I also know that worrying does more damage than it does good. It's counterproductive. I don't know of any Bible passages I've come across. If you have a problem, the way to solve it is worry about it. 
Now, I'm not saying that everyone can come over, overcome the worry habit. Some people have said they have, and that's great. I think the Apostle Paul may be one of them, for he says to us, don't be anxious about anything. And he gives some very good advice on how to deal with the overcome the worry habit. Paul tells us, rejoice, and again I say rejoice, the Lord is near. Some translations say, be happy, be happy. Being children of God through Jesus Christ is something to rejoice about, isn't it? I mean, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are God's children. And Paul says, and he's near, and we know that with God, all things are possible. Some people think that being a Christian means you, you can't enjoy life. You should go around with a sad, long face. This is exactly what C.S. Lewis thought about Christianity. He discovered just the opposite. Blessedness and happiness and joy, he says, are products of faith. When people said, they asked him how he's dealing with joy, he replied, to tell you the truth, I, the subject has lost all interest in me since I became a Christian. And the composer Joseph Haydn has often been criticized for the gaiety of his music. He said, I can't help it. When I think of God and all of his blessings, the notes just fly off the spindle. And as I have a cheerful heart, he will pardon me if I serve him cheerfully. So the Christian learns to rejoice because joy is the evidence offspring of faith. And you know, laughter is a good thing to overcome worry. You see, when you're laughing, you don't feel any pain. Christ's message is one of joy and peace and hope. And it doesn't help, or it does help, doesn't hurt, I should say, to have a good sense of humor. With a good sense of humor, you don't take yourself too seriously. There's an old Chinese proverb that states, blessed are they who can laugh at themselves they shall never cease to be entertained. <laughs> you know, an elder in my former congregation in Illinois had a good way of keeping me humble. On Sunday, he would, um, he would come out of church and say, Pastor, I don't care what other people are saying, I think your sermons are okay. <laughs> and a woman came out of church one time, and it wasn't me, but she said, she thanked the pastor for his inspiring sermon. And he said, you should thank God, not me. And then she mumbled, huh, wasn't that good. <laughs> Besides rejoicing, Paul implores us to use prayer with thanksgiving. Anxiety and prayer are the two opposing forces. Prayer is immersing ourselves in the presence of God. But so whatever is bothering you, take it to the Lord in prayer, as we just saying. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. So when you're feeling anxious thoughts coming on, stop and pray. Think of God's power in your life. He can lift your heavy burden. There's a cartoon I saw in a magazine one day that depicted the following situation. Approaching the small bridge was a truck and on the bridge had a sign saying, eight tons load. On the truck was also written, eight tons. Now when the truck was crossing the bridge, a bluebird came and lighted on top of the truck. And with that, the bridge gave way and the truck smashed down into the water below to the surprise of the bluebird. Now, that's a wonderful ridiculous story. Of all bridges I've seen, it can stand eight tons. But every bridge, bridge has its load. Of course, we all have little bluebirds, don't we, of problems? We take little things that bother us in life, little bluebirds of uncertainty, little bluebirds of fear, and we become overloaded. It wasn't a bluebird. I mean, several bluebirds could land on the bridge and it wouldn't collapse. It was the fact that it already had eight, eight tons. We need to be aware that when we feel our, that things are really getting the best of us, when we're really feeling anxious, we need to stop 
and remember that the Lord is near. And then we can turn to him. Every person has a load limit, and we should become aware that when that happens to us, always a load limit, except one absolutely wonderful thing. God is not like that bridge. He has no load limit. You can come to him again and again in prayer, and you'll never unload him. The psalmist says, cast all your care upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. But Paul, Paul had, remember what he said here, he has said something about our prayer. He says, pray with thanksgiving. Our prayer shouldn't just be asking God for things, treating him like a Santa Claus, but rather to count all of our blessings. You see, when you count your blessings, you'll find all the reasons to be happy. Someone says it's like a mathematical problem. When you add up your blessings, it subtracts from your worries. Of course, the greatest blessing we have is God's forgiveness for us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave his life for us to claim us as his precious children. Through faith in our Savior, we know that all of our sins are forgiven, and we have the gift of everlasting life. That, in turn, gives us the peace of God that passes understanding. Paul writes here, Be anxious over nothing, but in everything by prayer with thanksgiving, present your requests to God in the Peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That word guard here in the original language is like a sentry watching over us to protect us. So whatever your problem, you can take it to the Lord in prayer. Dale Carnegie, you may have heard of him before, he, he gave a, a sermon a lay sermon before his congregation one day. Here's what he had to say. There is nothing that will ever you will face in life that can defeat you. Whatever your problem, you are able, through faith in God, to overcome it. By trusting in the Heavenly Father, you are greater than anything that can happen to you. Now, there's a positive thought. Right? With God, you are greater than anything that can happen to you. Do you believe that? With God, you are greater than anything that can happen to you. Another way to overcome the worry habit is to dwell on positive thoughts. You know, people who worry the most have a very negative outlook on life, and those people who have a positive outlook in life, they don't worry as much at all. So Paul says we should think about the good and blessed things of life. For example, here's what he says. Whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or worthy, think on such things. Paul was certainly an advocate of positive thinking. You know, research shows that it takes about 72 hours to overcome one negative thought and several weeks to overcome a bad habit. It also tells us that such thinking can overcome or can shorten your life. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So fill your mind with good thoughts, with thoughts of God, with thoughts of Jesus, with thoughts of eternal life. Remember that all of our sins have been washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we have a certain gift of eternal life, because Jesus not only died on the cross, but he overcame death in the grave, and he rose again and says, because I live, you shall live. So no matter what happens in our life, we have the assurance of eternal life. So when you get home today, I want you to do a little exercise. I want you to take out a piece of paper. I want you to make two columns. On the one column, list all the things that are bad in your life that you're worried about. On the second column, write all the blessings you have in your life. And I'll tell you something. The second column will far outweigh the other one, and yet we often let one little thing ruin all the good in our life. So be happy, rejoice, praise with thanksgiving, and the God of peace that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Because we know if God is for us, who the heck can be against us? Amen. Now that peace of God that passes understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ until life everlasting. Amen.
Please stand for the prayer. Come, let us offer our pr- to the Lord our prayers of our heart, trusting in his mercy to supply all things needed for this body and life and eternal life. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, that we may not reject Christ, the cornerstone, but build on him our hopes of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, that we hear your vo- the voice of your word, heed the call of the prophets, and faithfully proclaim the gospel to all the world, Lord, in your mercy. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, that all of our leaders guide us according to your word in the cause of justice and the provision of the common good, Lord, in your mercy. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, that we repent of our sins, believe in Jesus as our Savior, and show forth in our lives the good works you desire. Lord, in your mercy. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, that we find refuge in your healing wounds. Hear us especially, if it be your will, Lord, Bring an end to that war in Ukraine. So much suffering going on, Lord. Be with them. Help us to do what we can to reach out and supply things that will help the wounded and the sick and accept those who come to our country to help them settle in and enjoy the freedom that we have. We thank you so much, Lord, that we live in a country where we have the freedom, the freedom of religion to worship as we like and all of the things. Be with all those who are sick now, suffering any loss of job or whatever it might be. Bring your healing, Lord, on all. Lord, in your mercy. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, that we acknowledge your goodness and use well all the resources you have supplied us so that your name be glorified. Lord, in your mercy. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, that we who approach the table of your son, be worthy in faith to receive his body and blood, bear the fruits of repentance in our daily lives, and live in the unity of faith and the godly concord. Lord, in your mercy. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, to confess you before the world, and at last to rest our hope upon the promise of the resurrection, when we shall enter together with all the saints in light and life forevermore. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those who join the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and calling sinners to repentance, that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. By his death, he has redeemed us from bondage to sin and death. And by his resurrection, has delivered us into the new life in him. Grant us to keep the feast in sincerity and truth, faithfully 
eating his body and given into death and drinking his lifeblood poured out for our salvation until we pass through death to the promised land of eternal life. Hear us as we pray in the name that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as he forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night, night, the night that he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do with remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup and he gave it to them. Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
May this strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this beneficial gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Making announcements? Oh, she's going to make them. Good morning, Risen Savior. Just a couple of quick announcements before we end today. Um, we just want to give a big thank you to Summit Academy. If you haven't gotten a chance, the volleyball court is back up and ready to go. They had that cleared out and re-sanded. So a big thank you to the school here, Summit Academy, for all the work they're doing on our facilities and to kind of improve some of the stuff. So when you're ready for a game of volleyball this summer, or if you'd like to play some soccer, Colton got our, tenant, our soccer net back up. So it's just a great joy to see the kids and to have the opportunity for us here as well to enjoy some of these outdoor activities. The big news for today is the town hall meeting today at 10:45. Um, you got an email. You should have gotten an email yesterday. If not, let this be your announcement. Um, we are going to see if we can do something online for that as well for people who may not be able to join us in person. So watch your emails. Keep a lookout for that this morning. It will come pretty soon here in the next hour or so. Um, so today at 10:45, a town hall meeting. Some updates on call some board and staff changes, um, and just being in prayer here as a church, so we hope that you join us for that. Um, reminder, this week is our last midweek Advent service, so if you can join us for dinner and service this Wednesday, please do so. Um, dinner at 545, service at 630. We hope to see you there. If you have not received your Holy Week schedule in the mail, or if, you have, if you're not on our mail list right now, um, come see me, let me know. But there are also a few on the desks as you come in at each entrance and one back in the fellowship area. This will give you the schedule for services for all of Holy Week. So we ask that you join us for as much of this as you can as we just prepare our hearts for Easter. And the other big thing is the Easter Egg Youth Fundraiser. If you have a kiddo, if you have some grand kiddos, or if you have some neighbor kids, that would like to have some Easter eggs left on their front lawn for Easter, the youth will, you can sign them up. Um, the youth will be dropping around six eggs, or uh, excuse me, 12 eggs in each yard, and one of those eggs will remain empty. And you'll get a little note left on your door if you are egged by the youth group. And that note reads, we have hidden 12 eggs in your yard. Enjoy the hunt, but don't be discouraged when you find the empty egg. It's a simple reminder of Jesus' empty tomb, for he is risen. So if you know anyone who you would like to egg this Easter, um, there is a sign-up sheet right in the back on the fellowship, back on the wall. You'll see a big poster with this egg on it. Look for that, and you can sign up to have someone egged for Easter. And those are our announcements today. Thank you so much. Um, I believe we can stand um, for our closing hymn here. My hope is built on nothing less, hymn 575. 